Well, here we go again. Where we left off, there was a phone ringing in Washington, D.C. in 1967, somewhere near the Smithsonian Institution. What in the world is going on? Ding, ding, ding. We're talking about the next section of the book entitled A Tangled Web. And then one of the things I want you to think about and as the story's been going on is we've talked about timelines <clears throat> and those move in a rather linear fashion, sort of from left to right, one day after the other. But many cultures view time differently and they think of it as not opposing and not occurring in a linear fashion, but occurring in a circular fashion fashion and that time circles around and back <clears throat> and there's recurrence over and over and this story started off with a guy named Chotek who was fashioning a jade jaguar and the reasons he had to do so were complicated and horrifying and years and years later the jaguar is found by a guy named Octavio Chotek Sanchez and Sometimes it's worth thinking about how exactly does time occur. Some philosophers, Schopenhauer, Nietzsche, have addressed this idea a little bit, but Hindu and Buddhists have also done that. <clears throat> but here we are, and it seems to the time for these guys, it appears, has been moving in a linear fashion. So ring, ring, ding, ding, back to the story. A tangled web. The phone woke Roan from the daydream he had experienced so often over the past 13 years. Treviso! It was Dr. Peabody. Treviso! I need to see you in my office right away. And no, we can't do this tomorrow. Ten minutes. The line went dead. Roan stared blankly at the phone and then left his small apartment near the nation's capital. It was a beautiful spring day in Washington, D.C., the cherry bath blossoms, first planted during the Taft administration, were in full bloom. The sun was shining and the tourists were out in force. Ron Treviso was a plainly dressed, tall and slender, dark-haired man with a shy smile. His glasses kept slipping down the bridge of his nose and he had to push them back up as he made his way along the crowded sidewalk. Or just let them hang from a chain that he kept his glasses attached to so he wouldn't lose them. When he would just let his glasses hang, passers-by were stunned at the contrast between his dark skin and his very green eyes. He didn't notice their looks. He was an extremely reclusive consultant for the Department of Archaeology in the world-famous National Museum of Natural History at the Smithsonian Institution. He was only 25 years old and had so far had an amazing and amazingly unrecognized career. Graduating from Harvard when he was 16 years old, he had earned his Ph.D. in archaeology at the very young age of 21. Rome was immediately hired as a consultant for the Smithsonian Institution by Dr. Peabody, but only on the condition that he could reject any project that didn't interest him. <coughs> Excuse me. Dr. Peabody had reluctantly agreed. Rome was an extremely valuable resource for the Smithsonian Institution despite the fact that he refused to accept recognition for his extraordinary work. Roan's contributions and insights into the exploration of the North American coast by the Vikings were brilliant and cast further doubt as to whether Christopher Columbus was actually the first European to discover America. By age 24, he had already established a remarkable, although almost anonymous, career. Dr. Peabody considered Roan to be the most capable candidate to head up the Department of Archaeology in the unimaginable event that he ever retired. So he did his best to make sure Roan received proper recognition for his work, at least within the organization. None of that mattered to the young Treviso. He cared very little about more than whatever subject he was currently researching. Roan Treviso had become an extremely quiet young man with an all-consuming passion for the past. Only the best and most gifted archaeologists and anthropologists were hired to work for the Smithsonian. Competition for employment there was fierce, as a position with the Smithsonian meant that one had reached 
the top of his or her profession. But Rome worked out of his apartment as a consultant. He did not want an office in the Smithsonian or to be paid like an employee. Many of the other archaeologists who barely knew him were bothered by the special treatment Rome received. But even those who resented him agreed on one thing. Despite his very young age, Rome was the most gifted archaeologist of them all. His ability to draw complex and brilliant conclusions from the smallest amount of physical evidence was absolutely unique and sometimes controversial. For example, the current evolutionary theory placed the origin of humans somewhere in the Middle East. Based on his own research on the shapes and sizes of excavated skulls, Rome suggested that different versions of humans had developed simultaneously in Africa, Asia, and the Middle East. His paper on the subject, The Roots of Mankind, rocked the archaeological world and for a while disturbed his anonymity. Rome refused to give interviews or discuss his ideas since he would only draw attention to himself by doing so. He was not interested in the self-promotion that was necessary to advance careers, especially in the nation's capital. He simply had Dr. Peabody publish his theories while he quietly went to work on some other project he found interesting. As he walked from his apartment, fiddling with the old obsidian arrowhead that was always in his pocket, he wondered at the urgency in Dr. Peter Peabody's voice. I'll see you in my office in ten minutes, Peabody had said. Twenty had already gone by. Dr. Ralston Peabody was a man described by even his detractors as short on personality but long on vision. He had used his hard-earned position in an institution for over 35 years to create what to most people was the most respected archaeology department in the world. I wonder what this meeting could be about, Ron Treviso mused out loud. I hope it's not another project. I already have my hands full with paperwork concerning the Indians of the Yucatan in Mexico. I'm finding amazing connections between them and their ancestors. Many of the Indians do not even speak Spanish, but have managed to hold on to the languages that existed prior to the Spanish conquest. Uh, sorry, were you talking to me, sir? Asked the passerby. Roan, embarrassed, just pushed his glasses back up his nose and continued walking, quickly blending into the crowd. Twenty-five minutes after he had received the call, he walked into Dr. Peabody's sun-streaked office, apologized for being late, and took a seat in the corner, admiring the light that etched its way through the window, casting shadows about the room. Dr. Peabody was buried behind his desk under a mountain of paper and hardly seemed to notice Roan at all until... After almost five minutes, his arm shot out with a copy of the Washington Post newspaper. Read this, he commanded gruffly. Rome got up and read an English version of the same article that had upset the Pasha days earlier in Mexico City. Rome sat back down, crossed his legs, and set the paper down on his lap. The Jade Jaguar of Uxmal? Stolen by a senior citizen? Interesting. That happened three days ago, Treviso. Since then, the old man has disappeared from jail and the jaguar has yet to be recovered. The government's offering a reward, but as of now, they've got nothing. They're starting to think it's made its way back to the Yucatan. Well, so they know where it is then, suggested Ron. They think they know where it is. The Mexican government wants our help in finding out what happened and in authenticating the piece in the event it is recovered. Well, why send me? There are plenty of experts down there. Besides, I'm no detective. Rome began to get up to leave. Sit down. I'll tell you why. Because you're an archaeologist. That's why. You're an expert on studying materials from past cultures. Figuring out the past makes you a detective. And if I'm not mistaken, you are currently researching the Yucatan, for which I pay you a very large consulting fee. You'd be down there eventually anyway. I need you to verify that the artifact in question is genuine. I assume you know something about jade and Mayan carvings? Roan, now back in his chair, nodded. Well, I... And you won't be alone. You'll be going with Dakoli Reed. She's new to our anthropology department, and she'll be assisting you on this trip. Dr. Peabody, I don't think you need to send two people down there. Treviso, I decide if we need one, two, or even ten people. I make the budget, so that means I get to spend it. Do you have any idea what I do around here? 
I spend 90% of my time lobbying congressmen and senators to give us money so that we can keep our departments running and people like you employed. The other 10% I spend playing wet nurse to my staff. But sir, stammered Rowan, but nothing should be so. Dr. Reed comes highly qualified, magna cum laude in her class at Stanford. Her father taught anthropology at Oxford. She has a photographic memory, but as you know, deductive reasoning, figuring things out, are the nuts and bolts of our profession. She needs experience and it starts tomorrow with you. There was a knock at the door. Dr. Peabody rose to open it. Rowan deeply admired Dr. Peabody and appreciated the special treatment he received from him, but he could never understand Peabody's grouchy attitude. Just to irritate him, he decided to disappear into the surroundings of the office, using the blending technique he had learned from the Shantaya as a boy so long ago. Miss Reed, please come in. I want you to meet Ron Treviso. He, he's... Treviso, where are you? By God, man, show yourself. Rome saw an athletic figure with coffee skin, dark curly hair, midnight eyes, tight jeans, and snakeskin boots enter the office. She brushed by Dr. Peabody and struck a pose in the middle of the room, appraising Dr. Peabody's office as if she were considering taking it for herself. Rome was stunned by her attractiveness and simply stood there against the wall, unseen and unsure of what to do next. She was wearing a khaki shirt and a turquoise necklace, probably of Pueblo origin, thought Roan. Her almost black eyes quickly scanned the surroundings, looking past Roan as if he were simply another piece of furniture, which, to her eyes, he probably was. He couldn't help but feel a little disappointed that she was unable to spot him. The jet black briefcase in her hand was the only outward indication that she was professional in any capacity. She had a confidence about it that was immediately apparent. If Roan had known better, he would have imagined her as a rodeo rider, downhill skier, or perhaps even a Hollywood stunt double, a very pretty stunt double. He immediately regretted playing such a foolish trick on Peabody. Now what was he going to do? Dr. Peabody looked around the office and scratched his head. What the? I'm sorry, Mrs. Reed. He was just in here. He seems to get lost a lot. Both Dr. Peabody and Decoley Reed walked back out into the lobby to see if they could find Roan. Roan quickly reappeared in Peabody's office and came up behind them. Uh, you were looking for me? He asked innocently. The question startled Dr. Peabody, who jumped and then turned around to face Roan. He could only manage to say, Confound it, Treviso, before Decoley Reed quickly turned, shook his hand, and carefully looked him over. Let's get started, she said, taking control. Dr. Peabody calmed down and tried hard to conceal the glimmer in his eye and a smile on his lips. He had had a soft spot for Roan ever since they had met at Harvard. He couldn't help it. Dr. Roan Treviso, please meet Dr. DeColi Reed. Roan smiled awkwardly as he shook hands with the intimidating anthropologist, nervously pushing his glasses up his nose. Uh, nice to meet you, he barely managed. Eagerly watching how Rome would handle himself, Peabody shook his head and frowned. Oh, let's all sit down and talk. Before Dr. Peabody could say another word, Piccoli addressed Rome. If you're the Rome Treviso who graduated from Harvard at 16 years of age, received your Ph.D. at 21, and then basically disappeared, I have a bone to pick with you. No matter how hard I've worked and no matter how much I've accomplished, I only hear about this mythical Roan Treviso, the boy wonder from Harvard. You're a real pain in the you-know-what, you know that? Your doctoral thesis, which is a paper one must present to a board of scholars in order to earn a Ph.D., your doctoral thesis on Scandinavian exploration of North America is required reading even at Stanford. And I have to admit it is good, but I have some theories of my own I'd like to discuss with you sometime. I think evidence of Asian fishermen coming to the Northwest even before the Vikings arrived in the Northeast has been largely downplayed. At any rate, I'm glad to have finally met you. Roan looked back at Dr. Peabody, too stunned to say a word. It's settled then, declared Peabody, checking his watch. Here are your tickets, both of you. Your plane leaves in a little over three hours. I hope you two find out what's going on down there and put an end to this rigmarole. Jose Guzman will meet you at the airport in Mexico City. 
He's the curator of the National Museum of Anthropology in Mexico City. He's also a personal friend of mine, and I owe him this favor. See to it that good relations are maintained. Now each of you goes home and pack. Oh, and have a nice trip. With that, Dr. Peabody gleefully and mischievously waved Rowan and Decoli out of his office and was back to work. Roan walked back to his apartment in a thoughtful mood, holding a shiny black obsidian arrowhead in his hand. Feeling along its edges and running his fingers over the smooth surface helped him to concentrate. The trip with Dr. Reed might be interesting after all. As an archaeologist, he studied the remains of human civilizations, such as relics, artifacts, and monuments. As an anthropologist, she studied the history of human beings and their cultures. The two areas often overlapped. The jag Jaguar of Uxmo had a history of controversy as both a relic and as part of the Mayan culture. Perhaps something new could be learned about it. And, he had to admit, the prospect of working with the Coley Reed did not seem so bad after all. Ding, ding, ding. That's the end of the next book. And I think you guys are probably starting to wonder... What's going to happen in the Yucatan when he gets down there? Because there's been a lot going on with the Jade Jaguar. And of course, you know, he's completely unaware that his brother's alive and Remesio's completely unaware that Roan's alive. So you might be piecing some things together, but you got to be careful where you go with things like that. A question I have for you to think about, too, is <clears throat> how do you think Roan ended up? at this place uh how did what happened to him after the yanomami indians picked him up and why is he such a sharp kid who apparently spends all this time studying human civilizations and relics and artifacts and cultures of the past what do you think led him into something like that so do a good job on those questions. I think I've been seeing better and better answers. He's been doing good work. And when we pick up again, we'll see what happens when these guys get to Mexico. And we will have to try to finish this up next week. Ciao. Have a great break.